Yep. Okay, this panel for our 2022 internship week is called Career Advancement, Landing That First Job, Getting Promoted, and Negotiating the Best Salary. And we have our seasoned uh, professionals here. They're uh, all alumni, and they're going to share words of wisdom to you. Uh, before we do, however, I was told by our chair to have fun with this. For students who attend today, we are giving a dig um, bag for you, a dig mag uh, uh, tote, as well as um, gift cards, a couple gift cards, uh, $25 gift cards to Amazon to a, a two lucky winners in today's session. And we also have little gifts for you all too, um, our panelists. So anyway, thank you for being here. And let me talk to you a little bit about each, as I remember them as students here. Let's talk, Leslie Bryant was Leslie Torres as an undergrad. Can you, um, are you spotlighting Leslie right now? Uh, Debbie and Dan, she spotlighted because you're all kind of Yes, she is spotlighted. I'm I'm okay, waiting. because, okay, okay. And so um, Leslie Torres was a member, uh, and then she got married right after graduation, almost immediately after. And um, it's amazing because she, she's com senior communications consultant at Allergen uh, Therapeutics. And she was on one of my Bateman winning. Um, teams and public relations. She focused on public relations as an undergrad. She was in the specialization. They're recruiting for Bateman team now, Leslie. And oh, so okay. she was uh, on it for solo biz. And I'm pretty close to most of the members on that team, including Leslie. And uh, she was just a real go-getter. And she did her internship at um, Sullivan and Associates, which is very interesting. It was, uh, Barbara Sullivan is also one of our grads and she hired Leslie as an intern. And Barbara um, was hired as an intern by one of our um, faculty members, basically, uh, at an uh, agency called Communicore. And she began her internship at Communicore. Barbara was also one of my students. And she ended up um, taking over Communicore, making up Sullivan and Associates. And Leslie, I don't know if you know this, but she now uh, retired. And the intern, yeah, <laughs> one of the interns, her intern for her, uh, now took over the agency and has is hiring our intern. So it's just this one big cycle. And when I remember Leslie not long, uh, it's probably a decade ago, took me out to lunch when she was vice president of Helen Knowlton. And she just went up the ladder very quickly and stayed in healthcare the whole time. So that's pretty interesting, I thought. And Betty, Villa L uh, a Lobos, right? Wasn't that your maiden name? Uh, yeah, Betty Villalobos, and I'm now Betty Chavaria. Chavaria, oh, thank you for pronouncing yeah. that. And and Betty, if I recall, I had her as a student in my 311 class, and she was always a go-getter. She, You wanted to work on your writing so bad. You know, you weren't one of these students who would argue about grades. You'd basically be so hungry to learn how to be a better reporter, how to write better. How You know, you were just that kind of a, a student. And then you went on and did two internships, I remember, and you were in my internship class, too. You did one at, um, I think, at Hot Life Public Relations, and you were an editorial intern at Sun Newspapers, which I think is in Seal Beach, right? So um, it was great. You, you, like a lot of students, looked at public relations as well as journalism, and you just had a love of design. And then you were also design director for the Daily 49er and then turned it around and then became editor and designer at the Southern California News Group, which, by the way, we have a student on the next panel or an alum who just got a job there. So you're and then you then you went to Gannett and Nashville, right, in USA Today. And then after that, you went back to the LA Times, came back to us, and then were taken by the Washington Post, which you all is one of the most prestigious publications and influential publications in the world. And now she's section, special sections visual editor. So cool. Now, Heather Yeomans is a, oh, and Betty and Heather are 2013 grads, and um, Heather came back and got her MBA a few years ago from Cal State Long Beach as well, which is a great degree to get if you stay in our field, and she is Global Public Relations and Communication Manager at Fender, and you know Fender by Fender Guitars. Now, I met her, I was also um, her advisor, she was in the, the honors program, I was advisor on her uh, work 
there and she was public relations, but she also freelanced uh, as a newspaper reporter. And she did this incredible section, whole section, huge section on jazz, just herself, uh, interviewing jazz um, performers and writing this incredible piece in the Orange County Register. I was so impressed by that. And she was a singer at Legoland. I remember seeing your recordings <laughs> and she uh, tried out and was um, did the American Idol thing as well. And we wrote about her in the Daily 49er, I recall at the time. <laughs> and yeah, I'm bringing back some old memories here. Yeah. <laughs> and and it was just amazing. And But what it, what's interesting about Heather is she has this love of singing and she has a singing career as well as taking her love of music and combining it with a professional career. It was just probably, was it a year or so ago she, you contacted me and you asked me about one of our other grads, which is Mike Terry, vice president of the Kings, <laughs> right? Communications and said, you know, you were interested in doing um, the national anthem, right? And Ooh. now how many national anthems have you done at major athletic uh, uh, games? Huge like amount. Right? I sing for the Kings like at least twice a season now. Yeah. Yeah. But you <laughs> sing at other places as well, Thank right? You. For other ball clubs. Yeah. It's Clippers, Dodgers, Oakland A's, Padres, all of it. It's crazy. But our grad network, uh, our alumni network is really strong and very supportive. So thanks for that. Emma. Yeah, well, yeah, they are. So, okay, let's, uh, let's start with Leslie and maybe you could tell us a little bit about your career. I, I talked cool. about you from a student or from a faculty perspective watching you. So I would, we really want to hear you share words of wisdom about your career and advice that you give students. And I'll be taking notes, you guys, if I don't look like I'm advice. Well, I mean, I think I think you kind of set it up nicely. I was I was a fairly active student um, at Cal State Long Beach in the public relations major. And I, I did get involved in Bateman um, through Emma's art of persuasion, as you've all probably experienced. I joined the <laughs> Bateman team and that was a really great experience. And, you know, I think it put me front and center in a way that I was able to have a lot more access to our professors, which was probably gave me a little bit more visibility than I would have had otherwise. Um, I did also, of course, have Barbara Sullivan, who many of you may have had as an instructor at a point, as my 370, I think, was the more advanced writing class that we would take. And Barbara was really instrumental and took a big interest in helping me hone in on my writing because it I felt like it was an aptitude for me. I wanted to get better at it. Um, so when I started circulating around, asking around if anybody was looking for internships and she surfaced and asked if I wanted to intern for her, it was sort of a surprise to me. And what's sort of interesting is that, you know, I think the most important point is, is try all the things. Because when she told me about her agency, it sounded, to be truthful, it sounded really boring to me. I'm like, cardiology? Mm you know, healthcare. Okay. Well, you know, it's an internship. I have to do two bird in the hand. And I went for it. And what I didn't realize is that it sort of put together my love of writing and all things public relations with what I always had, which was a little bit of a, a, a passion for science. You know, I had wanted to be a nurse when I was very young and did not have the chops in science and math to pull that off. And so here I am sort of in an adjacent field where I work with you know, life-saving professionals and drug developers all the time, you know, it's constant learning. But working with Barbara as an intern turned into a full-time job with Barbara, which launched me into healthcare, which at that time was not a field of specialty that was very well known yet. And I kind of just stuck with it. And I think that would be the biggest piece of advice is I think there was a lot of discussion at that time as to whether or not somebody should generalize or specialize. People thought, well, if you're too niche specialty, you might not be able to find a job if the time comes. And I found it to be really quite the opposite, that if you have experience in a specialty, you are kind of hands, you know, leaps and bounds above somebody who may be coming in who is more of a generalist, who may not have had that healthcare or automotive or entertainment background, just makes it easier for the hiring party from a learning curve, teaching standpoint. So I think that would be the big takeaway for me is to, to think about what interests you. Like Heather obviously loves music and she's, she's there, but in a PR capacity as well. So 
the publicity capacity. So I think that's a that's an important thing to think about is how how can you bring some things that you're interested in? Because doing something you're not interested in is not gonna not gonna work for very long. <laughs> Great. Hey, Leslie, your uh, uh, sound keeps coming in and out at times. Are, are anybody else experiencing that? Is it just me? Can you guys, is her um, the audio coming in and out? No, it just must be me. Sorry. No, um, Emma, it is actually, um, I'm experiencing it too. It's probably network bandwidth. Oh, okay. Bandwidth. Got it. I think we have like 50 participants. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, Okay, wonderful. Okay, Betty, what do you what do you have to say? What can you share with us about your career and how you have advanced and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think um, Leslie set it up really well, saying, you know, um, find your the thing that that you love and continue to do that. I mean, I I was lucky that um, Gary noticed that. Um, hi, Gary. <laughs> noticed that I had a, you know, a knack for design and pulled me in and, you know, really taught me the fundamentals um, that has really stuck with me throughout my whole career. Um, and, but, you know, actually while I was in school, I actually came into journalism wanting to do reporting and I tried it um, and I found that I wasn't like hard news reporting was not for me at all. Um, you know, I, and I did a, a couple pieces for the magazine. Um, I liked that a little bit more, but I really, I knew for a fact that I liked design. Um, and I just, I could, I, I realized that I could do it for hours and not feel like it was for hours. And, uh, you know, that was enough for me to pursue it. Um, and so, you know, um, and beyond that, I really, I really, the one thing I always really say is like, take care of your relationships with everyone that you meet, because mm -hmm. even if it's like a short, you know, meetup, you know, uh, I walked the editor of um, at SoCal News Group from like the journalism department to his panel. And like in that short five minute walk, like I ended up meeting with him later and, you know, he hired me for my first job, um, you know, and, you know, there was one year I went to SND and met um, Greg Manifold from the Post as a creative director. I met him there, you know, had a 15 minute chat and then later on he hired me. So, you know, people really remember you um, every everywhere you go, especially in journalism specifically, like it's such a small industry and everyone knows everyone. So, you know, take care of the, the relationships that you do have. Like, um, you know, I, you know, I still talk to Gary and he, you know, has really helped, you know, um, me in every, uh, position that I've had like connecting me to people and even after I leave positions I still you know um you know send a Christmas card to my old boss or something you know just because um these managers and people they will remember you and you want to make yourself known um and you know one day you might be working with them and you want to make sure that that relationship is good um so that would be my biggest advice because I have moved from position to position. And in each, each time I moved, it was because I knew someone who knew someone. So, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's my biggest, my biggest uh, piece of advice for anyone, you know, and if I meet anyone from back school, I, I know Alex, he's, in the next panel, I he worked at the LA Times and he was great and I remember him. And you know, if you ever wanted to come to the post, like I would vouch for him. So that's what I would say. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay, Heather, it's your turn. Um, okay. Um, first off, Emma was one of the best mentors and teachers <laughs> I had at Long Beach State. Uh, <laughs> I'm so grateful for you in for in so many ways. Um, I came into the program wanting to be a journalist and I took my classes my first year and I was at journalism day and I had written a piece, I guess it was like a pseudo internship for this blog, Greater Long Beach. Um, I, I met the editor through the radio station at Cal State Long Beach and 
I told him that I was, uh, I had been a, you know, a child actor and professional performer and musician. And I, I really just wanted to write about that. So he gave me an opportunity and I, I reviewed like a professional theater show in town. And I went to journalism day. I printed out a, f- a few copies of that review. I brought business cards that I had made for myself. And um, I went to Danny Paskin, um, who is also one of my professors. And I asked him, here's what I wanna do. Who should I talk to in this room? And he pointed, pointed me over to John Corrigan who was at the time um, the editor in chief over at um, LA Times Media Group, but covering like like the Orange County papers that they own, like the Daily Pilot. And um, and so I went over and I, I waited like 20 minutes to talk to him. I just stood there, I did not leave uh, because that's, that's just not who I am. <laughs> I really wanted to talk to him. And I gave him, uh, he was he was just so busy and like, uh, um, you know, caught up with other people. I gave him a copy of my review and I said, it's really nice to meet you. Danny said, I should, I should, you know, meet you and chat with you. And I gave him my card and he read it. And he, he called me like a month or two later and said, hey, um, you know, I'd love to bring you on as a freelancer can you come over to the office and can we sign contracts? And at the time I had just turned 19. Um, I had only completed my freshman year of courses. <laughs> and um, I went in and he asked me how old I was and I told him and, and he said, you know what? He's like, I got my first freelance gig when I was 18. So, you know, it just took somebody like him to believe in me. Um, and I just, I talked to the most incredible musicians and celebrities and actors um, at that paper because it was like under LA Times Media Group. So like a, a lot of these publicists like wanted to give me access um, to the talent that they had. Um, and so I did that for like a year and a half. And then um, I was at another journalism day and met a reporter from the Orange County Register. And I had told him about my experience um, uh, prior and that I was looking for another freelance gig. And um, he referred me to the entertainment editor at the Orange County Register who read my stuff. Obviously my portfolio was a lot bigger by then. And um, I got that gig right as I was graduating. Um, So I was, uh, and at the same time, I was also looking for PR internships. So I knew at that point that eventually, like I wanted to explore PR and I wanted to do that in the entertainment industry. Um, I just didn't know how to get in just yet, but I had a good thing going with journalism. Um, and then I ended up landing an internship at Hill and Knowlton, um, which is funny. We have another H and K person on the, on the zoom right now. And, um, I, I came in with a big portfolio of, you know, all my stuff for my classes and then all my pieces that I'd written as a journalist and, uh, the internship was for the entertainment and tech uh, uh, clients in the LA office. And um, it would be like 90% of my time working on Fox movies. And that's definitely something I wanted to do. I know mu- music was always like the main thing, um, but I did my interview and it turns out like I, through my performing career as a musician, I had sung uh, songs on on movie soundtracks for 20th Century Fox and was talent at an event. And I didn't even know it, but I had met the client. And I asked them in the interview if they knew him and they said, yes, that's our client. And so I already had a relationship there and I ended up landing the internship. I mean, Betty said it best, like, you gotta nurture those relationships. You never know when those people are gonna come into your life and make something happen for you um, and put in a good word. Um, did, had a great time at Hill and Knowlton. I learned so much. There are some really incredible professionals that work at that firm. Um, I just loved how global it was in scope and uh, you know, worked on everything from Fox and the Rose Parade and Dolby to Target and Mazda and just things that were kind of like out of my wheelhouse too. But I really, at, at, you know, at that agency got to, see what really worked for me and what what I liked, what I didn't like. And then, um, then I got the gig at Fender. I didn't know anybody at Fender and I applied. I had a friend who sent me the job listing and was like, this is like totally you, you should apply. And I got it. 
Um, I've been there for six years um, as a uh, global PR manager. And I've worked on some incredible campaigns with, with just artists that I, I've worked with, Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys, Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, um, Niall Rogers three times, her, Sean Mendez. Like it's ridiculous and I pinch myself every day, but I recently took a position at Sonos and now I'm gonna be leading um, North America PR and influencer relations. Um, and my last day at Fender is on Friday. So <laughs> it's, right. uh, and I, you know, I really didn't know anybody at Sonos. Um, I did interview with one, one of the eight people I interviewed with um, had worked closely with my former boss and the person who hired me at Hill and Knowlton. And it was that reference that I think really helped me get the job. So um, yeah, you never know who's gonna, who's gonna come in and, and help you out later. So I think it's just try to just be, be a good human to everybody that you meet and support people and do what you can. I love that. And by the way, when I was in college, I had the biggest crush on Jimmy Page of Led oh, really? Zeppelin. Yes. And he's, you know, now instead of all the <laughs> brown, black hair, now it's all gray, right? Long yeah, gray hair. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Wow. I'm impressed. I'm impressed with all three of you. My gosh. So I have to ask you guys, based on what you had, you're saying a lot of very interesting things about, you know, um, networking. Like you all really focused on using the resources around you, such as faculty and really get in there and JPR day. I, I, I just learned from you all how important JPR day is to networking and nurturing relationships, as you say, and creating those relationships. Now, I have to ask you, though, you know, some of our students, because I've worked with them so long, will maybe not have the confidence that you seem to, you know, emit. Um, you know, they think, oh, I, you know, I'm a C student or I'm a B student and I, I'm not that good or I don't really have the confidence. And I keep telling them you do. You've got this incredible skill set just to be a senior through all of our program. And what you guys don't know is now we have multimedia classes and social media and digital public relations classes. I mean, we've grown. So there's so much available to them and they're, they're more skilled than they realize. But, but how can they break through that kind of lack of confidence or maybe shyness that they they have? You all um, have always been somewhat outgoing. I find all students to be outgoing, but sometimes they tell me they're really not. And they just come out maybe when they talk to me because I'm so outgoing. I don't know. So what do you guys suggest? You, you know, what if they say, the, you know, they're not you, you know, they're shy. They're not as confident, maybe not as talented as you. What do you have to say about that? Um, yeah, I th oh, go ahead, Leslie. I'm, I just would say find out what you're, you know, you don't have to do what Heather did and just like approach people at JPR Day. If like the face-to-face -face is not comfortable <laughs> to you or taking, you know, some people don't want to sit down and have like coffee with somebody because it's like a lot of pressure. Find out a way that you're comfortable communicating. It could just be building your network over LinkedIn, following what other people are doing and saying, hey, I, I found this interesting. Would it be possible to jump on the phone for five minutes? I want to pick your brain. Um, I'm, you know, I'm working on a project, whatever the case, like if you, if you track people that you think might be helpful to you and you create relationships, you know, it doesn't have to be somebody that you met necessarily face to face. And, and I use LinkedIn all the time to figure out if I know somebody who knows somebody. Um, people are usually pretty well, well open to saying like putting together two people, you know? Yeah. I mean, so I actually would say I can relate to the being shy part. I I feel like I was always scared of the word networking because it's like you got to talk to as many people as you can. Like um and I I can relate. I I I don't that's intimidating to me. But what I found useful is going to um like events and you know take a partner with you. So take someone with you just to like meet people together, you know, and um yeah maybe maybe you you heard a panel or you heard someone speak and you're like wow I really liked what they said you don't have to follow up with them if you don't want you can send them an email send them an email say I really liked what you said um I think this this and this um and then you know hope we can connect later or something like that you know so um or you know when I go into events I I, I don't necessarily go out and speak to everyone but the the conversations I do have, I'm I'm dialed in, I'm listening, and like I, you know, um, 
I, I, I focus on that person at that moment. And maybe I don't get to talk to everyone, but that's okay. Like me and that person or two people, you know, hit it off and maybe we'll meet again another day. So I, it, it's okay to not, to, to not feel like you need to talk to everyone. Cause you don't, you know, it's just those, 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 like I said, those nurtured conversations. Yeah. I think that was well said. Um, for the students that feel maybe maybe the confidence isn't there because you're like, oh, my grades aren't where they should be. I feel like school is important and it gives you a really great foundation for where you go in the future. But some of the people that I've seen move up the quickest in PR, um, they just have these like really cool personalities and, P and the ability to connect with their coworkers. And um, they're also very talented, but like, it's almost like their personality like gives them the edge. Cause it's really about like those skills of like how you connect with people, even, even internally within your organization um, that can really help you grow. Because like, if you're well-liked, people are going to want to, are going to want to help you. They're going to want to recommend you for jobs. Um, so I would say it's not, it's, it's not just grades. It's not just, um, you know, how good you are. Even, I know it sounds crazy to say that. Um, it's a lot of other soft skills that are going to make a really big difference. Um, I also, I, I share the story with um, those who have interned at Fender. Um, when I was at Hill and Knowlton, uh, interning, I, it, there was one other intern with me and at the end of the internship period, they had to decide, and I found this out later, they had to decide who was going to get the full-time job. So it was me and this other guy going to head to head for this internship. And I think that he and I both kind of knew that, but we were like friends and it was, it was cool. But, um, they said ultimately like why they chose me for the full-time job was because I wasn't afraid to speak up. Um, and I think it's okay to be, to be shy, but I think it's like knowing those moments when you're in a room with a lot of executives or, um, you know, senior level employees and leaders of functions, like knowing when to share a creative idea. Like I'm, I'm always impressed when I hear an intern just come out in a meeting with like, even if it's like far-fetched or like just that they have the guts to do that and to share their ideas. It's just so important because that's what you're there for. Like if you can bring your own unique perspective to everything that you do in that internship, nobody else can offer that. And, and when I started at Hill and Knowlton, that's something that like a senior vice president said to me, he was like, you're here for your, bring your perspective and ideas. Like, that's what we need from you. So don't forget it. <laughs> I love that. And Betty, you were saying, you agreeing that, uh, to that, if you kind of speak up and say, yeah, you know, I, mean, yeah. I, I really like the part that Heather said about like being yourself um, and just, you know, being comfortable and you're like no one else at a company. And that's a good thing, you know, uh, you know, when I first, when I first was applying to the post, like I, you know, I'm not a politics person. Like I'm not, but like, you know, buttoned up and, you know, I am, I'm, you know, I like to decorate and I'm loud and I laugh <laughs> and this and, you know, and, um, I was, I was truly afraid that I wouldn't fit in. And, um, you know, I spoke with someone who used to be here before and said, that's why you should go that because you're different, because you bring a different perspective, because there, there might be things that you see that other people don't. And so, and, you know, since I've been here, like I've been able to like, you know, pitch ideas and, and they, you know, they see the light of day and it's so exciting to see when that happens because, um, you know, I just think about, wow, like what would have that happened if I wasn't here? Like who would someone else have, you know, brought that up? So uh, just like Heather was saying with the intern, like, you know, even if something sounds a little bit crazy, like maybe it's not crazy, like just, you know, speak up, be comfortable and you're going to be, maybe you're different than everyone there. The background is different, you know, and that's all right. Like publications and companies need that diversity in their, um, their, their team. So I wonder yeah, really quick when I was an intern at Hill and Knowlton working on the Fox account, I, Emma had 
<laughs> said, and it brought me back down memory lane that I, I sang at Legoland. And when I sang at Legoland, I met all these like Lego builders. And when I went to Hill and Knowlton and we were working on all these movies, I was like, we should every brainstorm. It was like a joke. At, at one point I said that we, like, we need to build this out of Lego bricks or this out of like thousands of Lego bricks and one brainstorm, I said it and the idea stuck. It was for the Grand Budapest Hotel and um, it was for the home entertainment release. And we built the hotel out of 50,000 Lego bricks. It was like an award-winning PR campaign. And um, so yeah, no idea is too crazy. Even if people laugh at you, you never know like when it's really gonna stick and work. Wonderful. You know, um, I, I, Heather, you brought something up that I actually had already written down earlier, and that is about personality. Like I, I've had students who were all A's and they did really well in class, but they didn't seem to arise as quickly as the three of you. Um, a B, a, they didn't. And then, but then you'd have someone who maybe was a C student, you know, um, having a good time in class, um, certainly had all the classes, but would go very quickly up the ladder, you know, whether it was in journalism or public relations, because they had that personality. And what can you comment on, you know, I feel that if you're with easygoing people who are good people and ethical and happy, happy people, or at least bring positivity to the workplace. I feel that's important. And that can help you go up the corporate ladder or the, you know, whatever ladder you're going up. Do you agree with that, that personality is important to um, be able to continue to be where people, that you create a kind of a team environment or you're there and, and it's, it feels good to be around you, not bad, you know, not, not tense. What do you think about that? Any thoughts or do you disagree? I would say it's like more authenticity, like be okay. your authentic self, right? So, you know, maybe some, you know, everyone is different, like I said earlier. And and you want, you don't want to go in and be a bubbly person if you're not a bubbly person. That's okay. You know, maybe you're like, you know, like, I don't know, heads down person, but you're really good at your job and, you know, you come through maybe not, uh, you know, in your personality, like bubbly, but you really impress people with your, your diligence and your hard work. So um, I think, I think it matters to an extent, but it's not everything. Um, I, I think, I think people can tell when you're not being genuine or yourself or, or trying too hard. Um, and I know, I, I know that, you know, when you're in a room with a lot of people that may seem intimidating, like you want to put, you know, your best self forward, um, but you still want to be yourself. You want to say the right thing, but be yourself, um, laugh at the things that are funny or, you know, respond in a way that you would normally respond. Um, because yeah. Got it. Very good. Yeah. So Leslie. Most of the people here will probably go to the agency side at the outset, right? Because there's just more jobs there, especially in California. But, you know, by and large, agencies are meritocracies. They are fairly flat in their structure. Um, if you're able to do something and you show you can do it, you'll keep getting more of it, especially if you're junior because you're at a low bill rate, right? So they make a ton of money off of you when you're junior. So if you can bang out press releases that an account soup used to have to do, you're going to get that press release every time. And I think it's really more about not just being genuine, but being proactive and saying yes to things. You know, mm -hmm. if you hear somebody running around your supervisor trying to find, having a conversation, and this is where I'll, I'll get to the network, the, the, the work from home stuff, which is a little bit of a troublesome thing. But if you hear your account soup sitting there trying to figure out how to get stuff done that's coming down their way, jump in and say, you know, can I at least take a stab at it? Can I take something off your plate? Um, and then reliably deliver on something on, on the timeline, right? It may not be perfect the first time you give it over, sure, usually isn't. Um, but I think if you if you speak up, um, if you understand that there's opportunities that you can you can kind of jump in on, even if they're not technically yours, it might even be on another team. You may be on the automotive team and someone over in, you know, Adidas needs help, help. And, you know, goes a long way. And it's it's probably more to what Heather was saying is like, you know, somebody who is a team player 
that exhibits those sort of behaviors, um, you might just find yourself with a leg up that you didn't even realize, maybe just because you didn't want to be bored or you're kind of interested in sports um, and you're not on that team, but they needed help. Um, so you just have to, you just have to look for the, the chances. I agree with you, Leslie, so much. Like that proactiveness goes such a long way. Um, yeah, and I think it's just, you know, as I was saying goodbye to people at Fender this week, I'm saying, setting a lot of, I mean, six years at a company, like there's a lot of people to say goodbye to. And, um, you know, as I was writing, I wrote like personal notes to like 150 people because like, that's just, I, when you've worked with people for that long, it's like, you, I don't know any other way to say goodbye. Um, I, there were a few people that really like stuck out as I was writing the notes. Cause I was like, and I said, you are the definition of, I got your back. And if you can be that at any organization, whether you're in-house and you're that for the person on the creative team or on the social media team, or you're that for, um, you know, the, the VP in, in your office at the agency, like you're, you're going to move up. I, I feel like it's like that camaraderie and knowing that like those people know that you've got them and that you're dependable and that you're a team player and that you're going to be easy to work with. I think it's, it's all of the above um, from what's been said here. And, um, and also like, if you're naturally like a funny person, like within reason, obviously, but like, let that come through because some of my favorite people to work with have great senses of humor. And sometimes when things get stressful, um, a little bit of humor can go a long way and, and people will remember that. And, you know, you know, if, if, if that hits well with them, they'll love working with you because you keep it positive and light. I love that. Very good. You know, you brought up, um, Leslie, you said something about um, working from home yeah. um, and something about you would get into that. What, what were yeah. you talking about there? Well, do you we mind? were talking about the network. And I think um, people do a lot of net, like building of their network when they're early in their career or when they're looking for a job or when they're at any point, some people network in episodically, right? They'll network a lot because they're thinking about making a move or they're thinking about this and then they forget about it. And I think you have to think of the network like a plan. Like you really have to just keep it going because that's the disingenuous part, right? Is if you don't surface or say anything about anybody's anything forever, and then you surface when you're looking for a gig, Good. it kind of lands a little gross. Um, and the other piece is that it's harder now to network because we are all fairly virtual. So it used to be a little bit easier when you were tossed into meetings where there's coffee breaks and you have time to talk to people and exchange information or just get FaceTime with people. And I have found that I feel like for, for entry level folks, it's a real bummer, like that they don't get to have that FaceTime with your senior level people, see how they're interacting with each other, seeing who the good actors are, the bad actors are. And I think, yeah, you have to be a nice person. You have to be a good person. You shouldn't stab people in the back, but I don't think that it means that you can't be like, you know, forceful in your opinions or, you know, aggressive, you know, Heather aggressively pursued that Lego thing until it was going to happen. And you just keep pushing, pushing things out. Like sometimes I'll be called dog with the bone because I'll get an idea that I think is really good. <laughs> mm -hmm. And at a point, someone, but I, but, but if it, if it hits a wall enough times, you have to be able to let it go. But I mean, those are the soft skills that we were talking about before mm -hmm. that you don't, you don't really learn in a, virtual environment as much so you guys are going to have an added an added work added work to try to build that for yourself um which is which is kind of too bad so you know if you can find a hybrid environment at least or I know the work from home thing everybody's really gravitating to but and don't do anything you're not comfortable with but I think you should consider that there are things you will lose um by 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 going that route especially when you're when you're starting out Wonderful. I, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing to add. I'm about to onboard at Sonos and this is my first job where I've had to onboard completely remote. Crazy. And <laughs> it's something that I, I'm interested to see how it goes because, you know, I had that Fender before 2020, like three to four years of in-person relationship building within that organization. When you're in-house at a company, um, you know, 
growing relationships and finding allies, that's how you get work done. And, and that's how you succeed in-house. I mean, there are a bunch of other factors as well, but like, you know, we are in a very different time where we have to learn how we present on Zoom. Like, how do I come across on Zoom versus in person? Because sometimes that's different. Um, I had, like, sometimes I look up on Zoom when I'm like thinking. So I like look up, but it can be, that can like look like an eye roll. So it's like, mm. you have to think about those things <laughs> when you are in a meeting and you are in front of a camera and you're not in person. Cause in person, none of that would be read that way. Um, so yeah, we're in a really interesting time. And I think a lot of us are still adapting and, and figuring out the best ways to communicate in this, in this new world, in this new environment, but definitely get, like Leslie said, that, that in-person time, it's, it's super invaluable. Um, it's funny you say that, Heather, because I actually onboarded um, last year during, it was all virtual. I was still in Los Angeles. So can confirm it was really tough, um, really, you know, <laughs> yeah. a little bit um, isolating. You know, I did know like one person when I came to the team and so uh -huh. that helped, but, um, you know, I will always say that like, you know, it, it's so different when you have someone next to you to just be like, hey, real quick how do I do this you know mm -hmm. um, and the, it is a missed opportunity but you know if 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 the company that you join does have a headquarters or or does have some like some base I would encourage to at least visit like when mm -hmm. you start and like and make time to meet every single person that you that you can in your team while you're there you know um because in person is is you know, you talk more than, than just work and, you know, and that's important. Um, so, but if you are remote only, you can still make time by, um, setting up, you know, coffee chats, not related to work, you know, just to get to know the person. And, um, that will be helpful in, 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 learning about the person that you're working with, what they like, what, you know, what they don't like, what you can connect with, what you can relate to, um, you know, it, 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 could, it, it, it could change the way that you work with that person and with that team. Definitely. Just take those visits, you know, like if you're looking at a job and they're, they're giving you the whole spiel of best talent, regardless of location, that's great. But if their headquarters is in Minneapolis, have them write it down. You yep. want to be brought out to Minneapolis twice a year mm -hmm. and they're going to pay for it because you want to interact and you want to make sure that you have good relationships and they, if they don't see the value in that. That's a little, that's a, that's a flag. Yeah. No, but, yeah, no, go ahead. Heather. Yeah. Just as an example, Leslie, I think that's like, it's a great comment. Um, like for instance, Sonos, um, the company that I'm going to, they're headquartered in Santa Barbara. From what I hear, they bring out people <laughs> for, for in-person like on-site meetings. And then they also have apartments um, that you can reserve, they're paid for by the company. So they, they encourage people to still come up and, and work from the offices if they can, even if they do have to, to travel out, they have accommodations there, which I think is great um, for a company to do in this environment. Mm -hmm. So, so, okay, Heather, you'll be working uh, remotely most of the time in your new position mm -hmm. and, and you're, you're in LA and you'll be working, uh, your company's in Santa Barbara and Leslie, your company is in San Francisco, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you work remotely and you're in Long Beach. I'm, I'm in Long Beach and biotech and healthcare and pharma is by and large, San Francisco, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and mm -hmm. New York. Um, okay. So I'm almost always off of the mothership. Okay, got it. And Betty, you are, you're, you're in the Baltimore, right? Uh, you're around, you're in the DC area, correct? Yeah, um, the Washington Post is in the DC and I live in Vir Northern Virginia, which is just. Okay, are you uh, working remotely or are, are you in person? You're we're hybrid. We're hybrid. So we come in, we're asked to come in three times a week um, and then the other two remote. Okay. And do you have a schedule those three times a week or is it at your own thing? It's at, yeah, it's at our own discretion whenever, uh -huh. whatever days we pick. Um, okay. 
Okay, interesting. Um, this is fascinating. Um, so let's talk about salary um, because you all have been, I mean, first of all, before salary, you know, when I was going up the corporate ladder, so to speak, it was you had to be at a job at least two years before you jumped, you know, and they like to see some some commitment. Now, what do you think it is now? Because I've seen a lot of young people really jump different places to get their salary up and to keep going up the ladder, so to speak. Um, what What do you think? How long should you stay at a job or should you leave as soon as you get another offer? I don't know. What do you think? I have a strong opinion on this because I've recently done junior level hiring. <laughs> okay. I don't want to talk about time. I want to talk about titles. If you're jumping for a title, which is usually correlated to the salary. So somebody, you're an account coordinator and somebody comes to you and say, we'll make you in a senior account coordinator four months after you start as an account coordinator. We don't care. We're going to bring you over. You do this three times in a row. Now you're maybe like a senior account executive, kind of with account coordinator plus skills. Mm. Now you're over there with somebody who expects you to be able to draft content, proof, research your own stuff, and you don't have the skill set. And this has been a huge problem that I saw when recently hiring on the agency front, which was people were jumping around and I'm like, this person's an account supervisor and why do they need so much handholding? I'm looking at their LinkedIn and I'm like, they have an aggregate of five years of experience. They're not really account supervisor. So you have to be careful. If you have the capabilities and you have the chops and you feel good and you can go in there and operate at the level and read the job description, fine. But, you know, I've got a lot of people who are at the VP level who cannot put together a strategic plan. How does that happen, though? How do they become at the VP level then? I mean, how does that happen? They're doing this bounce, right? People okay. need talent so badly that they're throwing titles at people and job salary increases. And, of course, you're going to take it. Like, human nature indicates you're going to take it. Mm -hmm. Then the hiring manager who did the hire is stuck kind of realizing that they've found somebody who's been kind of persistently over promoted in a way right so have that has that person been jumping around agencies or yes. has oh has been okay got it got it got it so so really on the other side you as a hirer have to be very careful of that then i suppose when you bring on new people for your your team okay got it what what about the rest of you what do you think about that um should they stay at a job two years should they jump around what do you because you both have kind of well, you well, you're older and you are seasoned, so you've stayed it. I mean, six years at Fender, that's a decent, wow. uh, you know, tenure. So, oh, what about you, Betty? You've stayed so, at different. Yeah. yeah so I have actually, I moved around to four companies, but I've been a designer each time. I've been like a, I gain more responsibility as a lead designer every time. But I've been a designer. It was here after. Um, a year and a half of being at the post that then I became like a special section visual editor. So mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit different for me because I, I advanced, um, in, um, you know, finding, um, opportunity in new, uh, companies because there was something that I was missing in my, in my current company that I want, I wanted more, I wanted to learn more, but there was no resources for it. So I, I sought out, um, like for example, at the Washington post, I wanted to develop my, um, interactive storytelling skills. And, you know, I came here um, after being at the LA Times for three years. So I've actually never been at a company for more than three years. Um, and so I, I don't think it's been a negative because I've been learning a lot every single time and I've gained that skill set. But, um, and I, I have gained a higher salary every time, even saying a designer. And, um, so, you know, it, it, I could totally understand what Leslie's saying. So, you know, I, I've never like tried to pretend to be something that I'm not. Um, but, um, I definitely always, um, as far as salary, I always ask for more than what I'm give them offered. Uh, there has been a couple of times, like, um, my first job, uh, you know, you're so excited. You get your job offer and you're like, oh my God, yes, I'll take it. You know, you don't even think about it. Um, but <laughs> I have since learned, you know, and it is an intimidating conversation. And I, I, I 
don't like having it, but it is so important because, you know, if you don't have that conversation, someone else who might be less deserving is going to have that conversation. And, you know, you want to make sure that you, you show your value. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been, it, it's been a, a, a climb for me in, in, in company. So, um, yeah. Good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Like length of time at a company. Um, I think I was at Hill and Moulton for three and a half years. I've, I've stayed at least, um, minimum like two to three years at every company I've been at. Fender's been longer. I thought it was going to be a lifer at Fender. I think how long you stay at a company, like it's learning about like reading, especially for in-house reading the cycles of the organization and when is PR a priority among the executives and, and that, that broader strategy for the brand. And when is it more ancillary? Because that's, that's something that I've learned at Fender where, you know, in the beginning, when I first came, like they were really investing into PR and we've made a really great case for what we do, but it's just no matter what, like there's a point where they're only going to invest so much in a position you're waiting for somebody to leave so that you can move up. And I think you just have to know how to read that and know when the time is right. Um, as far as like negotiating salary goes, yeah, definitely ask for more. I was in my most recent offer that I got. Um, I really like, I think more HR professionals should be doing this at the upfront, but like saying what the salary is from that first like conversation, just to know that you're aligned. Like I interviewed at another company where they didn't do that. And it was like, they wanted me, but it was too low. And I had to de uh, politely decline. Um, at this recent offer, they told me that salary, I did all my interviews, I got offered and they came in significantly higher. So I, I felt like that was them making a gesture of, we really want you, we're going even higher than what we said we would initially. And I took it. Um, and there were a lot of other benefits included, included in it as well. So, I mean, usually I would say ask for more, but like in that situation, I knew that they were purposefully doing that because they wanted to seal the deal um, mm -hmm. on getting me locked in. So, yeah. So in terms of salary negotiation, it sounds like you have to be proactive, as Betty said, because somebody else is going to ask for it. And, and I wanted to ask you guys, too, because when I was doing in your field, in your position, there were never anything called signing bonuses. But you have those now, right? Signing bonuses and things like that. Yeah, Leslie, do you want to address that? Because tell us what that is, because that's kind of a new territory for me. Um, yeah, I mean... There's a question in the chat that's also related about negotiating, whether negotiating would actually hurt your chances of getting a job. And I think if you do it um, tastefully and respectfully, like Heather was saying that, no, it really shouldn't hurt your chances of getting a job. I think where you get into trouble is when you kind of come, I've had a lot of people say like, well, I have a master's degree because I went to grad school right after undergrad. And so I think I should get paid more. I'm like, yeah, but you don't have any skills because you did either didn't do any internships, have not had job, you went kind of straight on the school track, which is totally fine. But I might have, you know, a BA person who's got actual skills where I'm like, well, this is going to be a faster onboarding. So mm -hmm. that's kind of just stuff to keep in the back of your mind is like, what are you putting forward as your offering? In terms of signing bonuses, um, that's definitely a thing. Um, it's much easier for a company to get a spot bonus or a signing bonus, I think, to say, we're going to give you this one time, like a $3,500 for coming on board. Um, so obviously that sweetens the pot for your total comp for that year, but the company doesn't have to commit to giving it to you every single year. So it's sort of like, I think, a middle ground. Um, and then you have that whole year to make yourself valuable. Um, at which point, you know, you should be eligible for a merit increase if you're, you know, if you're playing your cards right that year, um, you know, and then don't just look at the salary as like a single number. There's salary, there's an annual bonus if you have one, there could be stock if you're working for an in-house kind of public company, um, you know, and then the soft fun things, right? Like I really gravitate to companies that close between Christmas and New Year's and don't make me burn my vacation. That's like a huge benefit for me. And not all companies do it, um, but it's really, really nice. So just think about the things that matter. Kind of uh -huh. to you. 
Interesting. You know what I too, when, you know, we're talking to an audience that that are going to be new graduates and get, finding jobs. And I know that when I started, you know, titles were so important to me. And then they could give you a title without really giving you much money at all. And now <laughs> I'm and I, now I'm show me the money. I don't care what you call me. You could call me, you know, floor sc scrubber. I don't care, you know, but money I care about. So do you find that too, where they'll say, you know, they'll entice you because they think you want that title and as you said Leslie sometimes they have the title and don't have the skills to go with the title that I find that pretty amazing so I don't know where it is now but there was a period because right now ta talent's hard to find right but there was a period where there were a lot of we called them dry promotions where you would get a title change but you would get no money and I just don't see any purpose in that <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 exactly. So you, you've given us a lot of advice. Any more advice about salary negotiation before I open up for questions after one last question of my own? I, I would say I would just, uh, um, you know, reviews are every year and every year it's an opportunity to ask for a, a raise, a, the merit raise. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the sooner that you practice and get comfortable talking about money, the better your chances of getting um, a raise. And, um, you know, I, I think um, if, if you are applying for a job and you're not sure what someone, what you should be getting paid, look on Glassdoor, or maybe mm -hmm. there's a pay study out there. Um, you know, I, they did a pay study for the LA Times at the LA Times and the Washington Post. And I used that as ammo when I got my offer. I said, hey, you know, I have this many years of experience. Um, and that's what some, you know, um, I see in the pay study that someone with my same years of experience um, is making this much money. That's what I would like to make. Um, and it's okay to ask for that. And um, so, you know, it does take a little bit of research, but um in, in the journalism industry specifically, I don't know, in PR, maybe um, Heather or Leslie can um, mention, but um, it, it, I, there is a trend that it, 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 you may only get a significant raise when you apply somewhere else and you get a job offer somewhere else, which oh. is really unfair in my opinion. But, you know, if, if, if that's what, it takes, I guess, you know, it, it, I don't like that, but sometimes I have seen that that is a way to get a raise. Um, but you might find any way that you want to take that other job. I don't know. Um, but that's just what I've, what I've learned in, you know, in all these years is, you know, I do your research, ask for more and like, honestly, practice what you're going to say, because then it's less scary. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. As for I'm just making my little notes and then practice. I I'm going to add that in my lecture. Great. Hey, uh, I before we open up questions, I do have because I do study work life balance among women and executive women. And you know, uh, Leslie, you have a, a young daughter. You know, eight, right? Eight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, Betty. Are you you got married since I I don't know if you have any kids now. I don't. You do you have, have children? I have a three year old. Oh, you do. Oh, my God. And Heather, you don't have kids yet, right? But you got married. You got married right after you uh, soon, pretty soon after you graduated a few years after to your yeah. longtime boyfriend. Yeah, so seven and a half years. Yeah. yeah because uh, How many years? Seven and a half. It's been seven already. Wow. And then um, he's a musician, too, which is good. Yeah. But but how do you guys. Um, how do you deal with the work-life balance? Because you're all, all three of you are in pretty stressful, uh, demanding jobs. So how do you, how do you do that? Do you not worry about it? Or you just, do you, you have a lifestyle that enables you to, you know, find care, you know, or what do you do? It's like a personal boundaries thing. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, okay. Personal boundaries. That's like a really, again, in the soft skills department, a very hard thing is to, to create personal boundaries to look without looking like you're not a hard worker or interested in, mm -hmm. in being a team player. And, and I certainly worked hard. I've slept in my office. I've traveled out and back internationally in 24 hours. Like I've done all these awful things, but mm -hmm. you know, I kind of knew that you have to do them every once in a while, but you just have mm -hmm. to find a way to create a balance where, or a barrier or boundary where they cannot become a habit. And I probably would enter those as like, I, I'm totally interested in helping out here. I just want to make sure it doesn't become like a habit, 
right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to travel like this all the time, or I don't want to be on like the, the crazy 24, 24 hour deadline all the time. Like, how do we get ahead of this stuff and come at it from like a problem solving standpoint? That's usually where the really late nights come in is somebody there in there has a lack of project management skills mm -hmm. and it trickles down and you find yourself having to do something very quickly that results in an unbalance. Interesting. Agreed. All right. You agree. Okay. Yeah. I would, yeah. Setting those boundaries very early on when you join an organization. So I'm, a, I'm joining a new organization. So I want it to be clear that I'm a team player, but there are certain times where I'm not going to be as readily available and we're all on different time zones. Like at least for the, the PR team at this organization, a lot of people are our East Coast time. So I know I'm going to have like earlier mornings. So I have to factor that into like how I set my boundaries and everything. Um, I, that the boundaries thing became even more important to me when I got more involved with my music career again after grad school. And, you know, for every hour, additional hour that I give to a company, that's an hour being taken away from either time with my husband or my family. Um, or, you know, that's one less hour that I can spend on, on building that other career that I have. And I know that there are a lot of people and uh, other publicists and social media managers that I know that have other businesses. Like I knew one girl that had a candle making business, one girl who has her, her robes and Nordstrom's, like she, <laughs> like there are people that have other passions. And I think it's just important to set those boundaries, um, to begin with, you know, and then as a manager, like really like practicing what you preach and being understanding with your employees with all of that because I think it really it starts in the top and it goes down to create a healthy a healthy work environment for everybody. Now, there's a signature thing that says don't let don't let emails being circulated by me on my time interrupt your time. Basically like <laughs> it's it's I don't want to have to schedule my email to be sent on Monday morning. I do want to just get it up and off and know that it went out and file it away but you know, that is on the footer of all of my signatures, which is, you know, we all, we all have our, our times when we work, this happens to be mine. Don't let it like stress you out. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I don't expect a response from you. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, we're coming down the home stretch here. So I'm going to uh, see what questions we have. Uh, uh, Debbie and Dan, how do they ask their questions since the chat is closed? The Q&A? <laughs> they go to the Q&A? Yeah, yeah. I just opened the chat. Oh, you just opened the chat. Great. And I have two assistants here who are going to give me some questions too. What questions do you all have? Sorry. Okay. We're taking it for questions, everybody. So the chat is open for you. And uh, Abigail, what's your first question? Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay. This is a good question. Um, uh, and it comes from our uh, JPR internship ambassador here, Abigail. And she said, you know, we kind of talked a little bit about this earlier, but what do you do when you have doubts about yourself? You know, you all are seasoned, obviously. Um, and you've been through a lot and have had a lot of work experiences. But when you're starting out, you might doubt yourself. Think you don't have the skills. Think you you can't do that. You can't be bold enough. What it, words of encouragement do you have or advice if you, if you have somebody who feels that way that they that they're not Betty, they're not Heather, they're not Leslie. But see, I knew you as undergrad, so I know how you were. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Heather was, uh, you know. You were always kind of driven. I got to say that, but less, less kind of easygoing, you know, um, <laughs> you, you were you kind of, more easygoing. Yeah. Leslie was real easygoing. She took the abatement team in stride. She, she wanted to learn a lot. She hung out. She was a great party girl with me on the plane to Chicago. <laughs> and, you know, we had this a good time and she was a real student and Betty you were always, you know, asking me questions and you were always concerned. You weren't, as I said, you were always wanting to see why I put a comma in a certain place or marked off for some writing. You know, remember that? I mean, it was, it was always, 
really <laughs> wanted to learn. And then you were in all in these internships and I would push you with saying, are you learning anything in that hot PR? Remember, I would say, what are you, what are you gaining out of this? And so you were just, you know, all of you really kind of, you know, just students. What, what, wonder if they have doubts and don't think they can be like you. And I, I, I know that they can, by the way, I know that they can. They can be you. I know that. So it doesn't go away. You know, the doubts like the, the project just goes from here and I'm doubting myself to here and I doubt myself. There's going to be certain things that you will get familiar with that you're like, I know how to do this well and I can do a lot of this quickly. Um, but there's still going to be stuff you're asked to do where you're like, I wish I could bounce this off of somebody before I was handing it over. But, you know, I think you just have to push through and, and put yourself out there and take the feedback. Um, otherwise, you won't know. Got it. Yep. Very good. Um, okay. Let me see what they say here. Uh, what have we got in the chat here? Uh, would you, do you mind if we connect with you on LinkedIn? Not at all. Absolutely. Go ahead. Very good. Great. Please do. Oh, Leslie, you already did it. Uh, what is the realistic starting uh, base pay out of college? What do you guys think since you do hire okay. and you know Glassdoor is low. Like think about when you look at Glassdoor, like you don't necessarily know the dates of some of those salaries that people submitted. And especially with inflation being the way it is, like it should definitely be above mid forties. I yeah, mean, like be Glassdoor is at like 46. So I'm thinking mid forties on the low side, maybe low, 50, oh yeah. 50, probably be 50 to be fair. Gosh, I would feel I would just, yeah, I would say. For like an account coordinator, I guess. Yeah. Account I mean, coordinator would be what, 50s, you say? I feel like early 50, like early, yes. uh, low 50s. 51, like 51. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, and this is and, in public relations, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say you're, it's going to be a lower rate at the agency level and a little bit higher in house. Mm -hmm. But you won't move around as much in house, and you won't get as much yeah movement. So it's move, yeah. Sometimes you have to move out to move up. Yeah, which is what I'm doing right now. Yeah. What about yeah. you, Betty? What about journalism? What's the well, starting pay? I don't know about like you know reporters and the wider scope, but I I I would say in my experience, at, at, you know starting out and I know people who come like from college they have like internship experience I think they start out like 60 um and so uh but my first job I was at like 30s so you know it's definitely increased since I started and a lot of it's been like fighting like the guild the guilds at these places like fighting for a fair wage um so the union the union pretty much the writers union. guild union got it yeah. uh, well you just you said the starting salary would be 60 um at least for design yeah for for a, for, a, for a designer who has um print digital and maybe some social experience so around like 50 60 um i don't know the salary for reporters um or any other part of um, a newsroom, but um, someone someone asked, um, do you think a master's degree is necessary? Um, I So it's interesting because I've been, I have always thought I would go back to school and I have asked many people, like, you know, um, like, I think it was Leslie who said, like, you know, you have a master's, but this person has a skill set. Um, I think in journalism, I would argue that your experience um, is a little bit more um, valuable than the master's that you have. Um, and you won't have school debt. So, yeah. Uh, or go to Cal State <laughs> Long Beach. I mean, honestly, I did my degree at night when I was working at Hill and Knowlton, my MBA. And I, I recommend it. Do I think it's needed? No. Um, I think it just, you know, when you're a pub, uh, publicist, you have a lot of face time with executives. And if you're able to speak their language, um, especially for an in-house position, you gain their trust a lot faster. Um, it's, it's not just about the degree. It's about how you apply the knowledge and use it to your advantage um, in your dealings within the organization. 
Yeah. And it's also I tell an MBA versus a master's, you know, master's is generally more academic. MBA is pretty practical from like a business yeah. acumen standpoint. So, yeah. and I, I put in the chat, like, I do not think you should just bounce from your BA to your master's unless there's a real compelling reason to do like you're going to go into education or something like right. that. Because if you turn out, you don't like PR or journalism or whatever, and you go on and you get a master's in that area or master's of fine arts in Betty's case, and you turn out, you go to work and you don't like it. Well, now you've doubled down and yeah, yeah. I, I have students ask about doing a master's. I said the only in public relations, the only degree you want to pursue if you do would be an MBA because a master's won't really help you unless you're in such a, you know, narrow field that you know, maybe a poli sci, I don't know, or something like that, but it won't be as valuable in a, as an MBA. What's interesting, I don't know, Betty, if you remember John Canales, but he's an executive oh. at uh, the LA Times. And oh, yeah. Leslie, you might as well. And and he was Daily 49er editor. He is also married to um, Robin, Robin. Yeah, Robin or um, Robin Jones. And <laughs> anyway, he is, um, or she, he got his master's degree as MBA. He mm -hmm. got it. And now he handles labor relations. As you mentioned, the guild, Betty, he yeah. ma manages labor relations for the LA Times. And so that's where he went from being editor, editor in chief or yeah. managing editor, I think he was, and then going into more of an executive, even higher level position and kept going. Yeah. He's also one of our grads. So he was actually a public relations major and I he kept asking me questions after class about journalism so about paper <laughs> cover, new, newspaper coverage I said you might want to think about changing over to journalism and he he's made a great career out of it so thanks uh, and then, then he hired me <laughs> oh yeah did he hire you oh he was yeah. the one okay <laughs> hey um I don't know <laughs> Do you want to look at the chat and go ahead and write any um, answers that you can have? There's also one, um, Debbie, did you say Leslie needs to change something? Fix it, I think. Oh, it, she said, Leslie, can you change your you from host to panelist? Yeah. So if you want, because I actually start another panel, we actually do pretty soon. Uh, we've got, you're, you're welcome to say and enjoy uh, our next set of panelists who are actually recent grads oh. and have just graduated. And um, I think we've got one from 2018 and then one from 21 and then from 22. And they're going to actually talk about maybe some of the issues you talked about gaining that confidence and how they prepared themselves because you're our seasoned group. They can't really talk much about negotiating salaries the way you can and how it is going up the, the organizational ladder, but you guys have been fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Really, we, we're, we're going to uh, make this available for other students to listen to who couldn't be here today, but we had at one point, I think about 60 participants. So thank you. Um, just a great. Oh, and if you wanted to know if you won, we'll, uh, the department will let you know if you wanted these in one of the gift cards, which we're giving to the next group as well. So thank you so much. And I don't know, is there anything you want to add before we conclude? I would just say you can do it. Yeah. Just try. To be <laughs> just try. It's just, just try. At least try. At least try. Yeah, and if there are any yeah. questions we didn't answer, just send them over LinkedIn. Betty, I think there's kind of one for you. There's somebody who's more of a geography illustrator or something along those lines. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think you got to all those. I will drop in my email, actually, if anybody wants to see. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Also, final comment um, uh, on the singing career side of things. I, I just sang backgrounds for Gwen Stefani for the Rockefeller Tree Lighting tonight on NBC. You won't see me, but you may hear me. So if anybody wants to tune in. Um, oh, God. Happening. Yeah. What time is that? What time is that? I think it's eight. Um, and I think what I'll say with that is that you can have a, a nine to five career. You can be a publicist or, or a journalist and, and have other passions that you pursue. Like don't ever let anybody make you think otherwise. You don't just have to pick one thing. Yeah. It might be a little busy and crazy, but if there's something that you really love creatively, that isn't your nine to five, um, go after it. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Again, yeah. one more thing. Like I even if you know you go into your role and you know, if I'm in design and I decide, I actually think I have I have an interest in social. I think I could do it really well. You can always 
move around in your company and try new things in your company. Like you're never stuck. Like there's, you know, we have a, 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 a guy who's a design editor now, but he did motion graphics. He did social, he did, you know, um, uh, what, what's that? Like, so you're never stuck wherever you are. You just have to like, at least try and then, you know, see what happens. So. I love it. I love it. Thank you, you guys. I know you have to get back to work yourself, but stay if you can hang with us. And we're going to uh, the 38 people we have here. Uh, feel free to uh, stay, stay and some of you will be staying for the next panel of young professionals. So thank you very much. Stay close. Okay. Thank you. Bye.